We have over 30 years of experience in determining values of automobiles, jewelry, art, collectibles, and antiques. For more information and appointments, BuiltMoreLoan.com. From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Parts of Mexico rely on money from the United States, why some U.S. politicians want to keep a percentage to fund the wall. Plus, a new startup delivering medical marijuana straight to people's homes. And women navigate harassment and the pressure to succeed in male-dominated fields. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Adriana De Alba. And I'm Danielle Kernkamp. Thank you for joining us. Alabama Congressman Mike Rogers has introduced a bill that would pay for President Trump's border wall by taxing remittances. The money sent home, home by immigrants working in the U.S., Cronkite News reporter Katie Berry traveled to central Mexico to talk to families who rely on the money to survive. I am so the mad. Sierra Gorda, we found entire villages mostly dependent on money from family members in the United States. In towns like Pinsquintla, residents say there are very few opportunities for work. <laughs> vibrant city of Querétaro, a region known for economic growth and opportunity. Many people live here comfortably. But travel three hours north into the rugged mountains of the Sierra Gorda, and it's a much different story. Most families depend on their relatives who are working in the U.S. I miss him. Anyone would miss their partner, the person they live with and love. Monica Castillo's husband picks oranges in Florida. She relies on that money to survive. The money is used for food, construction, among other purposes. In this village of only 500 people, residents like Marisela Suniga Ramirez say that generations have left for the U.S. Yeah. Because over there they pay a little better, and here, well, not that much. <laughs> Relatives in the U.S. wire part of their paychecks to support their families here in Mexico. Are you ready? President Donald Trump has threatened to tax remittances to pay for his border wall. That would mean less money for the mothers who travel hours to this pet supply store in Jalpan de Serra, where they can pick up cash and dog food. Marta Sandoval makes the four-hour round trip every two weeks. Her husband works in construction and wires money to this store. The day he comes back, my son won't know him. It's not going to be the same. Her husband has been gone for two years. The former first lady of Mexico says many families are separated by the necessity to earn a living. Todos los mexicanos most Mexicans have an immigrant, a close relative like I do in the United States, and the majority are undocumented. Zavala is expected to run for president next year. From the politician to the people, all are concerned about the future. Families like the Castillos wait in limbo, worried that new policies in the U.S. could threaten their loved ones and their livelihood. According to the Bank of Mexico, this past year, remittances were the largest source of foreign income in Mexico, surpassing oil and tourism. In the broadcast center, Katie Beery, Cronkite News. After a long campaign promising to be tough on immigration, President Donald Trump has been relatively silent about what his plans are for those with deferred action for childhood arrivals. Reporter Anthony Marroquin took a look at how this silence has affected a specific group of professionals protected by the program. The end of the year rush is in full swing in Yadira Garcia's high school class. It's just like, ah! But unlike most teachers, there's something else at the back of her mind. You have a stable job, you know, you have a house, like you want a house now type of thing, and then just like not knowing. Garcia is one of an estimated 1,000 DACA eligible individuals in Arizona working in teaching related jobs. The not knowing what's going to happen with that stability, that really sort of like 
just irked me a lot. Advocates say these teachers are more than just instructors, going beyond the curriculum to provide comfort for teenagers dealing with immigration issues themselves. Being able to have someone who says, hey, I might not understand your whole story, but I have lived a similar experience. It allows for people to feel connected and not to feel isolated. But advocates on the other side argue that we can't get stuck on emotions and that unfortunately, DACA has to go. No one can say that that's a good thing for these DACA recipients. The thing is though, it would, it would go back to what is legal. Roy Beck of Numbers USA said repealing DACA would do more good than harm because immigrant workers drive down wages for everyone. Here's the question. Is it right for the people of Arizona to get teachers for less than market rate. For Garcia, just the uncertainty of her status means she has to be ready for the worst. I'll be fine, but at the same time, it's like, if it happens tomorrow, like, then I have to have this plan for me from now until December because I wouldn't be able to teach. In Washington, Anthony Marroquin, Cronkite News. Nationwide, the Migration Policy Institute estimates that there are 20,000 individuals who are eligible for DACA that work as teachers or other related jobs. The United States making a major military move in Afghanistan, dropping its largest non-nuclear bomb for the first time. The target, a system of ISIS tunnels and caves. The international military action is just one of the issues on constituents' minds as they meet with their Arizona representatives at town hall meetings tonight. Reporter Alexis Stukrath is at Isaac Middle School, where Representative Ruben Gallego held a town hall meeting. Alexa? I caught up with Congressman Gallego just before the town hall started. I asked the Iraqi war veteran his reaction to Trump's order to attack ISIS in Afghanistan. I think the most important thing is the question is what was the effectiveness of it. It doesn't really matter how big the bomb is, but the question is what's the strategic value behind it and what the effective outcome of it is. If the effective outcome is that we destroy the capability of the enemy and that was the best way to do it, then it was a, it's a proper use of force. If it was just a show of force, then it was just a waste of money if you didn't actually end up doing anything. And these are the questions that I'll be asking, but we, right now we don't have those, those types of uh, answers. Gallego also talked about the current state of immigration and his plans to fight for reform. We'll have more on the town hall on cronkitenews.azpbs.org. In Phoenix, Alexis Sucraft, Cronkite News. Meanwhile, Senator Jeff Flake will hold a town hall meeting in Mesa in just a few hours. This comes after criticism for avoiding meeting with constituents so far this year. Flake announced a code of conduct for the event. Attendees are not allowed to bring in signs, banners, or quote, objects that create a disturbance, and people will be forced to leave if they don't follow the rules. The town hall is tonight at the Mesa Convention Center at 7 p.m. Parents, teachers, and activists gathered at the Capitol today to protest the legislature's expansion of the school voucher bill, which will allow public money to go towards private schools. And it wasn't just professional organizers and parents who were at the Capitol this morning. Grandparents were also on the grounds, making their voices heard on behalf of future generations. In Tucson, I have two roommates who are also teachers who live with myself and my husband because we can't afford to pay our bills unless we work together because we're not paid a living wage in Arizona. Dick Foreman, president and CEO of the Arizona Business and Education Coalition, says if we want to have quality schools across the state, we need to start with an across-the-board 4% teacher's raise. California voted to legalize recreational marijuana this past November. But until January 2018, you have to hold a medical card to purchase the drug. Coming up on Cronkite News, a new startup bringing convenience to the medical marijuana industry. Plus, how women are navigating harassment in science, technology, engineering, and math fields.
about now. We all know technology is reaching into new areas of our lives every day. Los Angeles Bureau reporter Lauren Negrete discovered how one California company is using tech to tap into the medical marijuana industry. Santa Monica, California, home to many tech startups, but none quite like this. Nug is the leading online cannabis marketplace uh, for getting cannabis delivery. We saw a huge opportunity in terms of being able to offer this convenience uh, to bring an on-demand technology to the world of cannabis. That's right, drug delivery. More than 100,000 users have signed up with Nug. We just saw tons of ways that technology could really bridge this gap, bridge the knowledge gap, bridge the convenience gap. Nug MD is the company's one-stop shop to get a valid medical marijuana card, which is required to purchase until January, when recreational dispensaries are allowed. Through Nug, doctors give prescriptions to patients like Tom through video chat. You can talk to a doctor and they'll tell you whether or not they think it's right for you, and so I did, and I signed up, and it was fairly straightforward. After speaking with a doctor, patients are emailed an electronic version of their medical card to use immediately. Signed up for uh, the site somewhere in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, and by that evening, I had a prescription delivered to me. Milligan says the merging of high tech and weed is creating a booming industry. I mean, we see uh, technology companies entering the space and uh, a huge diversity of ways. You know, our m online marketplace is just one of them. Nug works with 130 California dispensaries, and Milligan hopes to partner with those in Arizona soon. In Santa Monica, Lauren Negretti, Cronkite News. Over 40,000 patients received their medical marijuana card through Nug MD last year. One former Uber engineer story went viral. Susan Fowler detailed her year at the company in a blog post back in February, sharing stories of sexual harassment and discrimination. Investigative reporter Megan Finnerty found sexism is not an anomaly in the workplace. According to the Census Bureau, men make up 76% of the workforce in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. Many women in the field say they feel left out by the quote, old boys club, and accidental discrimination is still discrimination. Sometimes when you're the only person, when you're the only female, or you're a small group, you don't feel as comfortable asking questions, you don't feel as comfortable, maybe you don't even feel like you belong as much as the other people. ASU junior Stephanie Carrera is studying to work in a male-dominated field. She says female students planning to work in STEM are warned of mistreatment and underrepresentation, and they're taught to speak up. Sometimes there are comments about, oh, Oh, you want to do like med school or grad school? That takes so long. Like, how old are you going to be when you have kids? But for a man, they, would, they wouldn't ask something like that. One of the first things that I look at when I receive a complaint or a lawsuit involving gender-based discrimination is to look at the ratio, the number of employees, men versus women, that are employed by the company. And not just at the level that the employee is complaining about, but all throughout from bottom to top level. One time Uber engineer Susan Fowler claimed in her blog that when she repeatedly complained of mistreatment rather than taking action against management, Uber blamed her instead. Fowler wasn't caught by a glass ceiling, rather a glass box. She says she was mistreated and restricted for being a woman working at Uber. Uber's data shows 84.6% of their tech workers are men and women fill up the gap just at 15.4. According to research published by the American Sociological Review in 2012, some women said that experiencing sexual harassment just comes with the territory of working in male-dominated jobs. In February, Uber CEO responded via Twitter, insisting the company doesn't stand for mistreatment and would further investigate Fowler's claims. You see in companies that have meaningful diversity at all ranks of the company's operations, usually have less claims of discrimination based on gender, less claims of harassment based on gender. Robin Baskin McNulty works in STEM, but after being harassed, she says her career choices have been strategic. So it's really um, impacted the choices that I've made in my career as a result, because I'm not going to go into a, a job in in which I have to be a trailblazer. I think women, we have to work tougher, I mean harder, because men do test us out a little bit more. Um, but that's not because we're not capable, we can do that, and you don't have to be a jerk about the response, but 
you know, there's just certain things you're going to have to expect. Bethany Plaza of Women in Technology International says in the end, men aren't the enemy. Neither are the ratios. I mean, we can play the numbers all you want, but there's just as many jerks that are women as there are men or, you know, I mean, in every workplace we can call it. But I think, um, I guess it's my personal belief that we can make a difference by being decent people. I think we just need to kind of go back to the basics of humanity. I think, I don't think it's that complicated. <laughs> One way to change the industry is for enough women to enter STEM fields and outnumber the men. That's why the women we talk to still encourage others to go into the field. Megan Finnerty, Cronkite News. The battle to bring a new grocery store to downtown Phoenix is coming to a close. Coming up on Cronkite News, a groundbreaking ceremony years in the making. And we're seeing sunny skies right now, but what's in store for the weekend? I've got your forecast after the break. You're a dreamer Don't hide it from anyone Don't hide it from anyone Hey, would you believe me if I said We are here for the reason now This is our life, this is what counts This is for us, I will go With graduation about a month away, many soon-to-be college graduates are in the process of trying to find a job that could lead to a substantial career. Cronkite News reporter Cassidy McDonald spoke with recent grads and college seniors about the costs and benefits of that college degree. According to the Economic Policy Institute, those with advanced degrees saw the strongest wage growth at 8.5% from 2000 to 2016. Many students worry that this growth isn't enough to cover the rising cost of college. I've taken out tens of thousands of dollars in loans, so having that job that pays at the very, at the very least 55 to 60,000 will really help in my plan to try to get out of debt as soon as possible. And with the rise of the college premium, it means there is more competition for jobs. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the percentage who completed an associate's degree or higher increased 13% from 1995 to 2015. Most people have told me that since I have a technology job, I shouldn't have any issue finding a job. I probably put in for over 40 jobs now, and still I have yet to hear back from any of them. I graduated in 2016, and LinkedIn is actually how I found my job. It was very, very difficult. Bess Chucky says as the job market becomes more competitive, she recruits candidates who have significant experience. They really have this expectation that they're gonna get this job and that's it. A lot of students think that they just have to do school and they can't work but even just doing a little part-time job that gives you the skills and I think a lot of college students don't realize that. According to Dr. Dennis Hoffman from ASU Seidman Institute, having a college degree is more important now than ever. It's not like the old days when you could go to high school and then just walk up to the local factory and work on the line. It just doesn't exist anymore. Today there's very limited options for a person that doesn't have some sort of technical certification and, and that's largely due to automation. Hoffman predicts the demand for new employees will accelerate as more baby boomers retire. The future is very bright for people that have invested in college degrees. Even if you're finding it yourself struggling in early years, your time will come. That degree will pay off. You just have to hang in there. They eventually you will get the job. As seniors get ready to graduate and enter the workforce, having specialized skills and an ability to go to the extra mile will make a resume stand out. In Tempe, Cassidy McDonald, Cronkite News. 
According to a 2014 report from Pew Research Center, millennial graduates are still out earning those without a degree, with an average wage gap of 17,000 for those with only a high school diploma. It's an element missing from the downtown area, a grocery store. But reporter Amanda Liberto tells us there are plans to fix that. In the heart of downtown Phoenix this morning, a long-awaited project broke ground. The corner of Washington and First Streets is a dirt parking lot, but now will soon be downtown's first full-service grocery store. Variety reasons have been that way, but finally we have a developer and fries with the courage to do something big, and they're going big. Stanton and Phoenix officials have been advocating for a grocery store in downtown for a while, but grocery store chains were reluctant to build because the population hasn't been enough to sustain a store. Now, according to a census report in 2014, there are nearly 90,000 people living within a three-mile radius of downtown Phoenix and that number is expected to grow to more than 100,000 by 2019. What is a dirt lot now by early 2019 is going to be a Fry's food store, a retail shop, apartments, and more here in Block 23 in downtown Phoenix. The developers will get nearly $20 million in incentives. The construction starts today, and Fry's food stores hopes to be open by 2019. In downtown Phoenix, Amanda Luberto, Cronkite News. It's a beautiful day to head outside. We're at 91 degrees and sunny with winds a little bit abo above average, but across the state right now, we're in those mid to high 60s in Flagstaff in the Grand Canyon, 92 in Casa Grande, and then over in Southwest Arizona, we're at 89 in Yuma. But temperatures across the valley are basically in those mid to low 90s, 92 in Levine, 90 in Buckeye, and 92 in Goodyear. But over the next 24 hours or so, we're gonna dip down into some cooler temperatures. We're in those mid 70s about tonight at about 11 p.m. By tomorrow morning, though, we'll be in those 60s, low 50s even somewhere uh, in Buckeye. We're in 56, so grab that jacket when you're heading out to work this morning, but we'll be back in those mid-80s by this time tomorrow. Looking at winds across the state right now, we're a little bit above average. If you see, we're at 14, but we're back at calm by tomorrow morning. Taking a look at the seven-day forecast, we're going to be in those mid-90s this week and by in 80 degrees by Thursday. That's a look at your seven day forecast. First responders are often considered heroes, but they're not actually the first people to help. Coming up on Cronkite News, the heroes who work behind the scenes to keep people safe. I'm Scott Pelley, anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News. In our changing media landscape, it is crucial for journalism education to ensure a commitment to the truth, unbiased reporting, strong ethics, unwavering fairness, and above all else, accuracy. These are the hallmarks of ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. It's a place where students can innovate and transform the news industry while always upholding the values of the school's namesake. The Cronkite School at ASU, preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. Discover so much more at azpbs.org slash schedule, where it's easier than ever to find out what's on Arizona PBS. Access interactive digital and printable program guides, repeat times, and full episode descriptions. Watch program previews of best bets for the coming week. Search by title to find your favorite shows. You can even add programs to your calendar and get email reminders when they're about to start. It's easier than ever to find out what's on Arizona PBS. Discover so much more at azpbs.org slash schedule. When you want to be more connected, friend us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch us online. Dispatchers are the first people we call when we're in trouble. And Phoenix 911 operators are being honored as a part of the National Public Safety Communicators Week. Reporter Drew Marine takes us inside the Phoenix Fire Dispatch Center to introduce us to several who are being called heroes. We have them on the way out there for her. It helps uh, 
to know that you're appreciated, you know, and even though we don't need to be told that on a regular basis, it helps to have little candies and, and whatnot and notes. Um, it keeps you motivated too, to know like, oh, I'm really making a difference. In the middle of an emergency, they're the first person that answers the call. Whether it's handling a false alarm fire or helping administer CPR, Phoenix Police Fire Dispatchers are the calming voice on the other end of the line, staying with you until help arrives. And Fire Captain Rita Bigler says it's important to let them know that they are appreciated for all they do for the community. Stay on the phone with you, walk you through the steps to actually save someone's life prior to 911, um, actually getting there from your paramedics to the firefighters. And so that's vital because that four to five minute response time can really make a difference in someone's lives. Dispatcher Brooklyn Spychalski wants people to know that being a dispatcher can be just as stressful as first responders on the scene. You do um, go through a lot of that emotional and mental stress that, you know, other first responders go through as well. But the thanks they are feeling this week does have an uplifting impact. In Phoenix, Drew Marine, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, get the latest on new tax laws, new tax scams, and new tax tips as the filing deadline nears. And we'll hear about a new documentary on campers with special needs. That's the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour as tax day approaches a look at why citizens in many other countries spend a lot less time preparing their tax returns. That's Thursday on the PBS news hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. I'm Chef Mark Tarbell. Join me for a brand new episode of Check Please Arizona. This week our guests review Fired Pie, Anzio's, and the Spicery in our 1895 house. Don't miss an all new Check Please Arizona tonight at 7 on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS, a community service of Arizona State University. The Sandra Day O'Connor Institute Distinguished Speaker Series presents More Than 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl and the award-winning journalist, best-selling author, news reporter, and correspondent. Master of Ceremonies and moderator will be Christopher Callahan. You can attend this unique reception and luncheon at the Arizona